Hey, what's going on, champs? I'm Erin Deliosa. Welcome to an Immigrant's Life podcast, my podcast about immigrants and immigration and everything in between. Thank you for listening and downloading the show, and thank you for supporting my dad. Welcome back, Immigrant Nation, to another captivating episode of An Immigrant's Life. Today, we have an interesting story that is full of heart and sympathy and I know will resonate with everyone. But before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a moment to express my gratitude for the incredible support I continually receive every week for the past three years. It warms my heart to see our podcast reaching new heights and touching the lives of so many individuals worldwide, immigrants or not immigrants. I really appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcasting platforms. By subscribing, you'll never miss an episode and become a part of our growing community. And you can also follow us on social media. Our handle is at animmigrantslife at yahoo.com. You can email us at animmigrantslife at yahoo.com. If you have something to say or if you want to reach out or if you or someone you know wants to be a guest on the podcast, I would love to talk to you, so check me out there. I also want to extend a heartfelt thank you to all our listeners who have left reviews and ratings. Your feedback is immensely valuable to us, and it helps others discover the transformative stories we bring you. Now, let's dive into the heart of today's episode, where we explore the remarkable journey of a young upcoming journalist that traveled to the Dominican Republic to tell the stories of Haitian immigrants that have escaped the violence in Haiti. And I think I've said enough, so let me get to the point. Without further ado, let's get into the show. Isa, dalawa, tatlo. Today's guest is a journalist for Deseret Magazine. Just like Agent Scully, she believes the truth is out there, but so are lies. And for that reason, she dissects it through her reporting. Everyone, please welcome Natalia Galigza. Hey, Aaron. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for reaching out. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I, I love your podcast, so I'm happy to be speaking here with you today. Thank you. Uh, why don't you tell the Immigrant Nation where they can reach you before we get into anything? Yeah, so I can be reached through my company email if there are ever any like questions about stories or tips or anything like that. So that's going to be the letter N, G, A, L, I, C as in Charlie, Z as in Zebra, A, at Deseret, which is D E S E R E T News. Dot com. Hmm. What does it mean, the Deseret? Deseret is actually uh, a, a term to describe the uh, the proposed settlement out west when the Mormon pioneers were moving out west. Hmm. So there's a deep history in Utah, which is why the oldest newspaper in the state, Deseret News, is named after it. So for the magazine, we're kind of a subsect of the newspaper, so we take the same name. Hmm. Are you Mormon? I personally am not, no. Mm, okay. You said you're in Utah now, but originally you're from Florida. Do you move because of work? Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm born and raised from South Florida, so this is my first time l- leaving the state, which no. has been super crazy, very cool. But yeah, I moved out here for work initially, but I've been living in Utah so far. Yeah, apparently it's beautiful there. Oh, it's so beautiful. I am only used to flat green land in Florida. So the mountains here have been amazing. Yeah. And there's no crocodiles. Yeah, there's no alligators. There are plenty of those in Florida. So that's been different for me. (laughs) Yeah, that's crazy, man. Just living beside dinosaurs. (laughs) Yeah, I can't beat it. That's insane, man. Your last name, Galixa, where is that from? So my dad is born and raised from uh, Hungary. So it's a Hungarian last name. Oh, okay. But you mentioned you're half Brazilian too? Yeah, it's an interesting mix. Uh, My mom, born and raised in Brazil, my dad, born and raised in Hungary. They're two super different cultures and parts of the world, but I'm glad that I have like a little bit of these two weird different parts in me. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's beautiful. Thank you. Future babies, I call you guys. 
I love that uh, article that you wrote that you reached out about freedom just north of hope. Just the title alone is like fire. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love it. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about their incredible piece that you wrote for the Desert News. Awesome. So, yeah, so the story is uh, it's about what Haitian immigrants endure when they try to flee into the Dominican Republic. Hmm. Uh, I got to travel to the Dominican Republic less than an hour away from the nation's border with Haiti. And I got to meet uh, like three different families who shared their stories with me about leaving Haiti within the last year. Uh, there is a really intense humanitarian crisis going on in Haiti right now. So a lot of people have been fleeing ever since the president, Jovenel Moïse, was assassinated in 2021. So I it's been been pretty intense over in Haiti and a lot of people go into the Dominican Republic since, you know, Haiti is an island country. Those are the only two countries that exist on the island of Hispaniola. So the Dominican Republic is the only place people can go without traveling overseas. Hmm. Why did you choose to write about the story? Well, I knew that I wanted to pursue a story about what was going on in Haiti for the magazine just because it was kind of an unprecedented event in scale, and I felt like it was important. Our magazine also pretty frequently deals with international issues, so I felt like this was just an important uh, an important story to tackle. Uh, and since it was too dangerous at the time that I was reporting to travel into Haiti, at least without proper resources, I decided to go as close as I could, which for me was the DR. Hmm. How did you know that you're going to exactly in, how do you pronounce it, Beatty Libertad? Yeah, Beatty Libertad. Beatty Libertad. Yeah, how do, you, like, how do you know that that's the spot that you're going to? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was looking into uh, different communities that I wanted to profile. I tried to figure all of this out before even booking a flight or anything just to make sure that things would work out. And I was interested in bates, as they're called, because historically they are uh, settlements near sugar plantations. And historically, a lot of Haitian migrants were brought into the DR to live in those bates and work on the sugar farms. Mm. So even though they are mixed communities, like people from the Dominican Republic live there too, they are places where there tend to be Haitians who have relocated. Um, so I was looking around for those types of communities and I found some small different stories about Bate Libertad, which also just so happened to be close to the border, which I felt was important. Hmm. Um, so that's why I decided that particular spot. Take me to the step once you decided that you'll be reporting about this piece. Okay. How do you, like, do you, where do, who do you contact? Like, how do you know that you're going to be safe there? Where are you going to stay? I'm sure there's no Airbnb there, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's another really great question. So once I figured out that uh, I wanted to be doing the story and I knew where I wanted to focus on, the next step for me was finding somebody who was already based in the Dominican Republic who could tell me a little bit more about the area, the closest hotel that I could stay at that was safe. You know, mm. I have never been to the Dominican Republic prior to this trip. So I wanted to talk to somebody who could tell me more about what to expect. So I got to connect with a journalist based in the Dominican Republic who was incredibly helpful. She also happened to grow up in Abate, not the same one, but a different one in the country. And so she was super knowledgeable on the exact type of questions that I had about, you know, what to expect going in. So just connecting with journalists on the ground, people who are from the area, that was super helpful for me. Mm, man, you have cojones, man. And <laughs> I'm not going there. Are you crazy? Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. It was, I mean, I know I mentioned it earlier, but my mom is from Brazil. So going to a Latin country was kind of refreshing for me, honestly. I had never been to the Dominican Republic. It is different from Brazil in many ways, but... There were certain similarities in the culture, you know, how people greet you, warm up to you, the food, even the architecture sometimes. So it was really cool to finally go back to a Latin American country and, and report on other people's stories, but also kind of 
you know, be reminded of my own a little bit, if that mm. makes sense. Of course, yeah. How do you make sure you're safe? Do you hire a bodyguard or anything like that? Yeah, so if I was, you know, going into Haiti, I probably would have hired some sort of bodyguard just given the gang presence at the moment um, and the lack of police response. But in the Dominican Republic, things were pretty safe. I mean, I, I didn't feel, you know, threatened or endangered in any way. But I did in order to, you know, make sure going in that I wouldn't need any additional uh, security or anything. I checked in with that journalist I mentioned who was kind of guiding me through what to expect. And there were also some people uh, who are part of a nonprofit that works with people in Bate Libertad who also speak English that I was able to connect with and ask about, you know, like, like how safe is it? What should I expect? So I just kind of tried to double down and talk to as many people from the area as possible before going there and make sure that everything would be all right. And luckily it was. Hmm. I read your article in, by the way, I love how you wrote it. I love, Thank I love you. your style. I sympathize with that lady. What's her name? Jo Jocelyn Geffrad? Geffard? Yeah, J Jocelyn. She reminded me of my mom when she migrated to Hong Kong for work. Obviously a different circumstances, you know, but mm -hmm. but it's I, I like I understand her pain, you know, her leaving her kids. Why did you decide to open the pizza with her? Yeah, yeah. So I guess the reason why I decided to open with Jocelyn is because she she really lent a lot of detail and emotion. I mean, we had a really long and emotional conversation where we hmm. really allowed each other to get vulnerable and talk about, you know, her her experience and and her reality is also one that I feel like is not really represented as often in the media. Like, you know, people don't always leave worse circumstances to find better circumstances abroad. Like Jocelyn left like a family, a, a business of her own, a nice house in the capital, uh, and then you know, migrated at the, into the Dominican Republic where she encountered worse living conditions, but but she did it for her own safety, you know. So it's it's a reality that that I felt wasn't really always represented in media. I mean, we always think of like rags to riches, but not necessarily riches to rags, you know. Mm, yeah, exactly. That just show you so much that how bad it is over in Haiti that these people are willing to live this comfortable life just to, you know, roll the dice in this a different world and leave their kids. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really tough for Jocelyn, and and also another reason why I guess I decided to open up with her is that she she lived in the Metrosant neighborhood, which is near the capital, and the capital is uh, where gangs are especially present at the moment. I mean, gangs have, as of March, uh, as of a few months ago, at least, they have taken control. Some 200-something gangs have taken control of almost the entire capital. So that tends to be where a lot of the violence is concentrated. So it felt like an important place to open up the story. Mm. You know, one of my favorite part of your article was when she, she was cooking this food for her kids mm -hmm. and you said um, if I could say she hoped the extra food could help them feel as though she were still there at least as long the leftovers lingered yo that line was fire thank you so much I mean yeah it was definitely so emotional to listen to her talk about that moment because you know she was it was kind of the last time that she was spending with her kids for she didn't for an undetermined amount of time, you know? So she talked about just cooking for them, asking whatever they wanted her to make. And and she specifically mentioned how she, even after they finished eating together, she just like kept cooking. It was it was hard to say goodbye, you know? So that was a way for her to still still be there in some way and, and for her to be felt in their presence for a little bit longer. Yeah. And then you follow up with another fire line that goes, She's realized there was no amount of plantain she could have prepared to last long enough. I'm like, yo, what's up, girl? Let's get it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad you appreciate it. Oh, I love it. I love your style. I love it. It's just, it's just like you have this like reporting style, 
but then there's this narrative like in a in, for lack of a better word entertaining mm -hmm. you know yeah i'm really glad you appreciate it i i really think it's important especially when there are these really personal stories to have that narrative style you know like when people open up to you and, and they're so vulnerable and they give you all of these details about their lives and you're trying to make a reader connect with that person i feel like being as open and vulnerable in the way you write it is important for people you know like i feel like narrative is really the tool to help readers feel like they are meeting people they might never otherwise have met and are going to places that they might never otherwise have gone. Mm -hmm, definitely. I love that this article it, that you wrote is, you know, elaborate, full of details, uh, real, and also entertaining, like I said. But you know how the culture is now? It's clickbaity articles. Mm -hmm. and what stops you from leaning towards the clickbait articles and just continue writing these beautiful articles that are, you know, it does, it's not take two seconds to read. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think when, when you have the liberty of working for a magazine that has that kind of mission statement of reporting deeply and honestly and truthfully, then it makes life a little bit easier. There, as I'm sure you're familiar, uh, the journalism industry is definitely struggling at the moment. There are a lot of different newspapers that have shuttered across the country. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation that's pretty rampant as a result. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm based in the U.S. when I say across the country, though I'm sure it's probably the case elsewhere, too. Um, but whereas a lot of daily newspapers are closing and have to maybe resort to pumping out grabby articles uh i i feel fortunate enough to work for a magazine that's that's you know still committed to just producing high caliber in-depth magazine style stories which which tend to though not always be more in-depth than like a super quick breaking news piece if that makes sense 100 percent, yeah for sure when you apply for journalism did you know the future you're facing? Ooh, that is a good question. <laughs> so I had always known that I wanted to be a writer ever since I was young. I was involved with newspaper and literary magazines in my high school. So I knew going into college that I wanted to major in journalism. That was just a given for me. I didn't really realize the reality of how much the industry was changing until I got to college and was talking to and learning from different professors who, you know, had recently or were still currently working in the industry. Um, so, you know, it's definitely concerning, especially for someone who still hadn't gotten their start to be breaking into a line of work that was not in its heyday. Um, but Something I found that was interesting is that even though, you know, the future seems a little bit more complicated for journalism, the vast majority of journalists would not change their career, would not change the path that they took because journalism is, is it's just so rewarding and it's such a privilege and an honor to be part of it. So even though things can be a little scary, I definitely wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, you were created to be a journalist, you know? Yeah, I, I hope that's true. <laughs> well, since you're a kid, you're like, I want to be a journalist, you know? The, you knew in your heart that's what you wanted to be. You can't be an engineer. You're going to be a... First of all, you're going to be lonely and sad. Mm -hmm. Second of all, hey, we need journal good journalists like you. You're being selfish if you don't do your talent, you know? <laughs> That's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. And I would not make too great of an engineer. So I guess I'm doing the world a service by not being one. Exactly. Speaking of future of journalism, right? Mm -hmm. I saw that you also wrote an article about AI. And recently, there's a lot of uh, writers that are complaining about AI replacing journalists or writers. What do you think of that? Yeah. So that's a super loaded topic. It's really interesting because 
things are changing so quickly right now, but we're still at the cusp. So we still don't know exactly how that will affect writers on the day to day. Uh But I will say that a bunch of different newsrooms across the country, which was surprising to me when I recently found out, had already been using AI based models to write like breaking news stories for for years now. I mean, since the 2010s, at least. So it's been a while of AI kind of slowly trickling into society, even before, you know, the rise of chat GPT and these different programs that that make it seem like an explosion right now. Um, But of course, it is still concerning just because, you know, as, as time goes on and technology advances, our lives change. So it can be a little frightening to not know how they're going to change. But I will say that it's, it's going to be interesting seeing how, how we can use AI as tools to bolster journalism and more importantly, journalists, human journalists, instead of, you know, swapping them out altogether. Mm, are you scared? Yeah, honestly, a little bit. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I, I try to just reassure myself. I, I At least as of the current moment, a, a robot cannot replicate the kind of emotion and, and, and human, human essence that goes into writing stories, especially more narrative stories, you know, like in order to convey, convey a human emotion and a human experience, I feel like humans are the best people to do that Mm, like i said i don't think an ai can write those two lines that i just read because those (laughs) lines man when i read that line like girl you are on fire thank you so much and i hope i hope you're right i really really do (laughs) hope that a robot is not gonna be able to do so in the future but i Hmm. guess we'll just have to see we'll see for sure Another lady that you wrote about, uh, I think her name is Marie uh, Sonises, something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I, Marie. Yeah, I love her story as well. About can you can you tell quickly just tell a story about what what she is about just for the listeners? Yeah, of course. So Marie also left Haiti, kind of in a similar circumstance to Jocelyne. So she had like a beautiful home. Uh, she had family. But she also left due to threats of violence. I mean, she pointed out how she had even injured her leg running away from the sounds of gunfire at one point. And that was kind of a turning point for her where she realized, I am not safe. I I need to leave. And she had a young son at the time. So she decided to leave with her son. Um, And very similar to Jocelyn, I mean, they live in the same community. So she left the comfort of a brick and mortar house to like a more ramshackle type of structure. And one thing that really strikes me about my story too is that it's not always talked about when we talk about these immigration stories, but she really wants to go back. I mean, she does not want to be in the DR. She moved for her safety, but she would much rather live in her beautiful house in Haiti with her family, with her friends, with her community. And she actually had, uh, still has, to my knowledge, a huge bag packed at all time just with clothes and anything she'd need to just grab and go on the run. And there have been many times in recent months where she came very close to just, you know, leaving in the middle of the night, going back to Haiti, doing what she needed to do to get there. Um, but the thing that deterred her each time would be hearing from her family and seeing different TikToks, social media videos of just how bad the violence was still in Haiti in her neighborhood. So so that's the only thing that's kept her from going back at this point. Hmm. Speaking of the bag, that's one thing too that I love about your article, the symbolism of the bag, like the pack mm-hmm. bag on the side, ready to go, to go back or to stay. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that 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 sticks out to you because it really stuck out to me too. I mean, it really does just represent how, how stressful and how terrifying it is to always be on the run, you know, and not really know whether you're, you'll stay, whether you'll go, what'll happen to you when you stay, what'll happen to you when you go back. It's just a lot of uncertainty and, and 
it's really unfortunate that it's a reality for people like Mary. Unfortunate, yeah. Um, what kind of work are they doing there? Yeah, so since a lot of people are undocumented uh, and oftentimes not by choice of their own, like I also spoke to one woman, Sandra, who initially had her visa, but the cost of going to the checkpoint uh, just the transportation of going to where she would need to go to renew it and then paying to renew it, it just got way too steep. So she was unable to afford, you know, like updating her her legal status. But since a lot of people who had to flee had a moment's notice from Haiti are undocumented for financial reasons or whatever else, um, don't have a means of accessing legal work, they, they often resort to different little tasks that are accessible to them. So agricultural work, uh, one thing I mentioned in the story was uh, the harvesting of pigeon peas. That's a really popular way for people to earn that? some money. So pigeon peas, they're just like uh, these little green beans kind of that grow on trees. They are a tropical legume, so they grow uh, pretty much everywhere in the Dominican Republic. And the... Uh, the people who live in Bate Liberdad that may not be able to access work elsewhere, they have an abundance of pigeon peas like on the property and nearby. So they can easily harvest the stocks and sell them to farmers. The, the little uh, peels are used to feed cattle and the beans themselves are just sold as produce. So it's a way for some people to earn some money when they might not be able to you know, feel safe traveling into town to get a job at like a restaurant or something. Mm. Of course, these people are, most of them are desperate and now they're, um, they're being pushed in this one area. How's the level of petty crime in the Bate Libertad? Well, I didn't get to spend too long. I spent uh, a little bit less than a week just hanging out there and I did not encounter any sort of petty crime whatsoever. The community, as far as I could tell from my time there, seemed very tight-knit. Everybody knew one another and trusted one another, too. So from my own observations and talking to people, it did not seem like there was any, any severe level of concern or threat for petty crime. But the biggest concern for people who lived there were the military raids that mm. you know that was what everybody was afraid of is is uh, military police coming at any point in time and you know whisking people away for deportation so that that was a safety concern that people had how often do they ra get raided well when i last spoke to my sources when i was reporting they had experienced three different raids uh in in this year i believe through different rates this year so i don't really know how frequent they tend to be just because they're really sporadic it's almost impossible to tell when they'll take place uh but it's often enough that you know people live in constant fear of it of course oh. okay when they get raided do they just grab random people and uh uh, throw them back to Haiti or how do, how's the process? So that's a good question. As far as I know from talking to people, it is random. It's just, you know, storming the place and grabbing whoever they can grab. Uh, and then I'm not exactly sure how long or what the deportation process looks like, but I do know the goal is uh, to deport them back to Haiti when I was able to speak with uh, the International Organization of Migration, uh, they estimated that currently about 500 Haitians who escaped the Dominican Republic are sent back every day. Uh, that's a current figure. I know that the same organization, the IOM, said that more than 150,000 Haitians were deported from the Dominican Republic last year. So it's a really, I'm not sure exactly how often it tends to happen and what it looks like, but it's definitely a very consistent concern. Hmm. So 
uh, some South Americans, like uh, uh, Mexicans and Colombians and whatnot, when they're trying to cross the border to the U.S., they go to like, I don't know, like holes and different ways, right? I'm assuming Dominican Republic doesn't have that strong defense against illegal immigrants or whatever. Uh, how do these people get to uh, Dominican Republic? How do the Haitians get to Dominican Republic? Well, actually, it's it's really similar. The hostility against Haitian migration in the Dominican Republic is it's really similar to the uh, the immigration conversation we hear in North America. The Dominican Republic is currently building a border wall, just like there's a border wall in the southern United States. Oh wow! Um, so it's it actually looks more similar than you might think. Uh, but just like in the U.S., there are different people that uh, are hired to take people across the border. Um, the names for these people, like the titles varies, but there are people who are who do that for a living, right? Like they mm. will either take people across the border uh, just on little motorcycles or on buses. Their, their job is to just ensure that people get across safely. And a lot of people do that for a living. So it's... Uh, it's not as porous of a border as you might think, just mm. because there is that hostility with Haitian migration at the moment in the DR, and there is that border wall, but there are people who who know how to navigate it. Mm. And just like in the US, a lot of that can be even just like through, through bribery. I don't know, it, it can tend to look different. Uh, from person to person, case to case, but it's it's similar to what we see on the southern border of the U.S. Yeah, I had a former guest that she was, I think it was she was fourteen, with her siblings, two or three of the, her siblings. Uh, her mom hired a coyote, a person that yeah. brings you to the border, and mm -hmm. they didn't even know this person. Uh, her mom doesn't even know this person. For mm -hmm. a month, she didn't hear anything from the kids. Do you think that's happening there too? Oh, yeah. I mean, I know also that one thing that's happening in Haiti is just with the the current gang violence, there are different fuel shortages and, and fuel is how basically everything runs in Haiti. So what that means is a lot of times there is not any, any internet, any connection for people to contact their families. So yeah. I can imagine that uh, it's very similar in the sense that people who who take the journey to travel across the border probably go long stretches of time without contacting their families. I know that jo Jocelyn and Marie, when they made it into the Dominican Republic, they talked about always waiting by the phone to speak to their families because you kind of never really know when they'll have enough power to call. So it can be really, really stressful, I imagine. That's crazy. Why did Jocelyn left her kids? Why didn't they she bring them? So it was a fairly complicated reason. Uh, but to the extent that I'm comfortable answering, she shared with me that um, that she had family back in Haiti, her her parents, so her kids' grandparents. Uh, that could watch over her kids. And she also wanted her children to continue their education. And they would not have been able to do that if they went with her to Bate Libertad. So that was something that was really important to Jocelyn. Of course, ensuring the safety of her kids by making sure there were people she could trust to look after them. But they were young and, and she wanted them to, to keep, you know, keep some level of normalcy in their lives. So mm -hmm. she decided to make the extremely difficult decision to leave them behind. Yeah, like I said, um, yeah, my mom did the same thing. She left. She moved to Hong Kong to work for work, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, but I understand the sacrifice, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. What is she trying to accomplish by moving to Dominican Republic? Is she planning to bring them the kids over to and live in Dominican Republic, or just wait out till the till the things in Haiti is settled down and then she can come back? So she, her goal is not to live in the Dominican Republic. That's not necessarily what she wanted in the long term. She simply left for 
safety and with the hope of being able to to work and to earn money because violence had gotten so bad where she lived in Haiti that she wasn't able to to work without fearing for her life, you know? Mm-hmm. So she was hoping that traveling into the DR could help her earn some money to eventually take her family and move elsewhere. Uh, when she spoke with me about what she what she hoped for her future, it was taking her family and moving anywhere abroad, you know, be beyond the island of Hispaniola, either <laughs> the US or, you know, some other country. She didn't really have a preference necessarily. She just wanted to to get far away, basically, from mm-hmm. from where it all happened. Yeah. Like uh, I was asked a few times about like why did you choose Montreal or Canada? And mm-hmm. I, how I answer is imagine you're in a room and the room is full of doors and behind those doors you don't know what's behind. It could be a lion, it could be rainbows and sunshine, it could be chocolate, it could be electrocution. It doesn't matter. Once a door opens, you're taking the door. Yep. I mean, that's a really, really great way of putting it. You, it, It's a really challenging thing, I imagine. So, I mean, you just have to make a decision and run with it, knowing that you don't really know all the time what you're going into. So, hmm. yeah, I, I really sympathize with that. Yeah. Kidnappings in Haiti, are they targeting rich people or it doesn't matter? Again, as far as I know, it doesn't matter. Uh, There is a very, very, very large gang presence, at least 200-something gangs concentrated mostly in the capital. And they also have been uh, overtaking police presence. So since there is no effective government right now, since the president was assassinated, the terms for all senators and uh, members of Congress were expired. So basically, there's not a single elected leader left in Haiti. Wow. Which means that there's a huge political vacuum, right? There's a power vacuum. So the gangs have risen up to the occasion to fill that power vacuum. And uh, a lot of times the violence can be financially motivated, of course, uh, robberies, things of that nature, uh, kidnapping just to hold people for ransom. That happens quite a lot. Uh, but sometimes violence can even be just, since there are so many gangs, uh, gang versus gang violence, basically, like turf wars and things of that nature. So it's just a really, really complicated uh, web of violence that's going on right now. But uh, actually more recently, like, I remember reading up on updates within the last few days, and there's actually, interestingly enough, been a vigilante effort that started up in Haiti recently. So since the police force has retreated, for the most part, from the capital, um, a lot of people are rising up to try and fight gangs themselves. Uh, And... That, again, is complicated because uh, since the police have been ineffective in abating the gangs, this vigilante effort has almost created like a mini war, for lack of a better word, right? Because you have gang members targeting the vigilantes, the vigilantes targeting the gang members. It's just a lot of a lot of violence uh, in lieu of any sort of power structure going on. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. What did you learn about writing this article? That is a great question. I I learned how difficult it can be to really, really allow someone to open up, right? I mean, like, you want to navigate carefully when you're talking to somebody about such traumatic experiences. You want to be there for the person and listen to the person while respecting their boundaries. I mean, it was important to me that I hear the whole true story from these people, right? I wanted to hear about all of the pain because that's the reality of of what they endured. But at the same time, they have to be willing to share those stories because the last thing I would have wanted to do is re-traumatize anybody, put somebody in in a negative, negative state of mind. So one thing I learned is kind of just Allowing yourself to be human is sometimes the best way to forge these sort of connections and 
and access these sort of stories because if you want someone to be vulnerable with you, you're going to have to show them that you are a human first, right? That, that you know, or at least try to know how they feel and, and what they've gone through. Hmm. Speaking of that, how can you as a person prevent your feelings from taking over and making it impossible for you to assist the subjects of your reporting? Yeah, that is also another really great question. Um, I, I luckily know a lot of uh, people who are journalists who have reported in really traumatic situations. Um, and one thing that I often hear from people who have either been war correspondents or reported on other tragedies is that, I mean, it sounds really simple, but talking through it and unloading what you, you know, what's weighing on you and your reporting is really, really vital. Not to the people you talk to, not like the people you're interviewing, of course, because the last thing you want to do is dump more emotions onto them. But uh, other journalists, family, friends, therapists, if you seek that out, it can be really important to just allow yourself to unload when you hear about so much trauma and devastation, right? Because hmm. if you carry that for too long, it might prevent you from from gathering any more important stories to tell in the future. Yeah. So just talking to people. I traveled with a, uh, a photographer as well, who after each day when we got back to where we were staying, back from the Bate, we would debrief and just talk through everything that happened that day together. And I found that that was really, really helpful for me. Did you learn that by yourself or somebody like taught you that way? Well, I, I did study journalism in college. So that is something that I, that I gathered over time, just learning from different mentors, uh, people who had, had been doing this for far longer than I have and, and learning about what, what works for them. So Luckily, I, I uh, was taught this before going into that particular reporting process. Hmm. You mentioned that what's happening in Haiti is a political and humanitarian crisis. Why do you think no one cares? It's it's really complicated. I I do think that luckily a lot of people do care, but it's a really fraught situation right now with Haiti asking for the prime minister who is not democratically elected but who assumed power after the assassination of Jovenel Moïse. Uh, he has even taken the step to ask for international intervention, right? And that's a really big deal for Haiti because they've had really, really terrible luck with foreign intervention in the past, right? I mean, even a UN humanitarian aid effort a decade or so ago, resulted in a terrible cholera outbreak that devastated the country. So, and that was fairly recent. So, there, a lot of Haitians are wary of foreign intervention for that reason. But uh, nevertheless, the prime minister asked for it. But because of that complicated relationship of past failed foreign intervention, because many Haitians are wary of having more foreign intervention. And because of the nature of violence and how widespread and dangerous it is, all of these reasons kind of compound to different countries not really knowing whether they should intervene or not. Uh, I can't really like speak to the conversations that take place behind closed doors, but it seems like people, whether it's the United States or Canada or even Brazil more recently, are very on the fence about uh, sending out troops and, and intervening just because of historical reasons and also just just the nature of how how violent it is at the moment. Hmm. When you went to Dominican Republic to hoping that you are ha- going to write a story, what happens if you come back and you don't really have a story? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is something I definitely worried about. Um, you never really know. I tried to do as much pre-reporting as I possibly could before I got there. So I connected with as many people as possible. I double, triple, quadruple checked with people that there would be uh, 
an opportunity to speak to different families at the Bate when I went there. I tried to iron out everything as much as humanly possible before going there, just to make sure that I would leave with a story. But, you know, with these kinds of uh, reporting trips, it is true that you never really know what you're getting yourself into. And sometimes people back out, things go wrong. It was entirely possible that I could have ended up, you know, getting unlucky and not coming back with a proper story. But uh, I feel really fortunate that everyone there was super open and receptive and cooperative to allowing me to interview them. So I luckily didn't didn't have to worry about that too much. Mm -hmm. What do you say to mom and dad that you're going to go to Dominican Republic? To report? <laughs> I mean, I am still a pretty new journalist, right? I'm a fairly recent college graduate, so I am still a baby in my parents' eyes, of course. I understand You're going to be a baby forever. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I can totally see how that's that's likely to happen, but especially hmm. now, right? I am, I'm a fairly young person, and I am a fairly dainty looking person so mm -hmm. they they obviously were a little bit concerned because <laughs> it was my first time traveling internationally right that's a big deal mm -hmm. um but i just reassured them as much as i possibly could i told them about what i was doing to keep myself safe and that i was going as a photographer so i wasn't alone and all of that kind of put their minds at ease a little bit but i would be lying if i said that I didn't check in with them fairly regularly, even while I was in the Dominican Republic, just to put their minds at ease. Oh, for sure, man. Mommy's like, hey, you better call me every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, does it make you grateful that, you know, you live in the States and you see these people living in, for the lack of a better word, squalor? Yeah, I mean, of course, it really puts into perspective the privilege that I have and just the undeniable access to opportunities that I have just by nature of where I live and mm. where I come from. Um, it can be really challenging for that reason as well. Just that kind of guilt you feel when you are going into a place where you know the living situation is very different and mm. there's little else you can do other than just tell the truth of what you see. Um, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question more simply, for sure, it definitely makes me feel super grateful, very privileged, and just super aware of, of, you know, my circumstances versus the circumstances of other people. Mm -hmm. When you were writing the article, were you extra careful in choosing what words to uh, define or explain a situation? or people uh, uh, like uh, let's say i'll give you an example not that this is a journalism thing but just a, an idea when claire dane one of the she's a as, as you know a, a star in uh, movies when she went to the philippines she was asked like what do you think of manila and she said it was stinky and full of roaches which is partly correct but she got in trouble at, about about that when you were writing were you conscious about that Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the reality is that even though it's less glamorous, of course, than how a lot of people live in North America, just as a point of comparison, it the reality is that it's just it's just how a lot of people are forced to live for reasons beyond their own control. And mm -hmm. of course, you want to have empathy and you don't want to make it seem like like these people are are like you said living in squalor because even though their their living conditions are different the reality is that people also really try to make the most of it i mean it's really really endearing also to see i mean i know i i mentioned it at the end of that story but marie her husband for example he like built a makeshift bathroom that attaches to their home in lieu of using the communal latrines hmm. he has been fixing a bunch of different things that he finds to make their living situation more comfortable whether it's diying a refrigerator and different electrical appliances i mean like the dedication and the perseverance that these people demonstrate by doing whatever they can within 
their limited means to make their lives as comfortable and full as possible. Hmm. That's something that should be celebrated, not looked down on, you know? So hmm. I tried to be really sensitive with my with my wording. I did, of course, want to be accurate. So when I say, for example, that Jocelyn has a like a tin roof, that is the reality. That's the material that the roof just so happens to be made out of. But I'm not trying to insert myself as as a critic of their living condition by by uh, talking about it negatively, if that makes sense. My goal is just to speak as accurately as possible and and of course hold hold space for empathy and and, and understanding. Mm -hmm, definitely. You mentioned that uh, explaining the right thing, right? Reporting the right thing. What's your opinion about reporters putting their personality rather than reporting the news? So I think that it can be tricky. I mean, there are different forms of writing, like like personal essays, for example, or op-eds, which are intentionally supposed to be stories where people insert themselves, right? And there is space for that in in the broader media landscape of course but if you're not if you're trying to write something that is not meant to be a personal essay it's not meant to be an opinion piece then of course it's incredibly important to keep yourself out of it as much as possible because a journalist's responsibility is is to be honest and accurate and truthful and especially at a time like right now where so many people have a complicated relationship with the news. So many more people than in previous years don't trust the news. For those reasons, it's even more important now than ever before that we do our jobs as honestly as possible, with as much integrity as possible. So while there is a space for certain types of writing that kind of use more personality and opinion and all of that, for, for the bulk of just, you know, straightforward journalism, it really needs to be to be cautious and and as objective as possible, for lack of a better word, since we know that quote unquote objectivity doesn't <laughs> really exist. We're, we're all subjective beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like, I asked that question because, you know, sometimes you'll see reporters, they're reporting something about, you know, tragic and they start crying. For mm -hmm. me personally, I don't want you to cry. I want you to report the news. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I personally agree with that just in my own viewpoint. I, I feel like it can also really complicate it for the people you are reporting on. Uh, hmm. Like the last thing you want is to impose your own emotions on vulnerable subjects who are already going through tragedy and also the last thing you want to do is impose your own emotions on viewers readers however people are consuming the news right because the goal is to just report on the truth and let let the reader the viewer come to their own conclusion you don't want to lead someone to a particular conclusion you want people to feel the emotions themselves not the reporter to feel the emotions for others, if that mm. makes sense. Oh, yeah. That's that's how I felt, too. I hate it when they cry. I'm like, yo, we can get your shit together, man. You know? <laughs> report. Just report. That's your job. Do your job, you know? Like, I don't know if you remember, there's this one of the most famous picture, is a, this picture of a child in Africa. He was dying because there's a famine, and beside him there's a vulture. And, the, mm -hmm. of course, the vulture eats dead meat, right? And it became winner Pulitzer, and a lot of people say like, "Oh, you know, you why didn't you help the child?" You know, I'm like, mm -hmm. "Yo, he's a reporter. That's his job. He's not there to save them." Yeah, it it can be really complicated. Like I'm familiar with the photo that you're referencing too, and I mean, of course, of course, you want to help the person however you can. And I feel of like course. if it's a life or death situation, then the human in you should come before the journalist in you. Mm. But if it isn't a life and death situation and you're just doing your job to report on the news, then you really have to toe that line carefully. Mm, definitely. How much does the fake news affect journalism now? 
Well, misinformation is a really, really, really big deal. And um, I was doing some preliminary research into this before we, you know, talked today. And I found that it got especially bad during the pandemic um, and also just through social media platforms as well. uh, Because a lot of people who don't maybe read the news or read magazines frequently try to get their news through social media, which... (laughs) Of course, is complicated. Um, uh, it's it's definitely just imposing a lot of risk because, unfortunately, we don't really emphasize media literacy enough as much as we should, in my opinion. Uh, like in schools and and in communities, there isn't enough conversation about how to distinguish fact from fiction, mm-hmm. and what that means is that a lot of people will encounter something on Facebook or, you know, WhatsApp or wherever else and not know how to tell whether it's true or not. Um, And misinformation is an incredibly powerful thing. So it's really dangerous that we're living in a time where it's worsening as much as it is. Yeah, that's what happened in the Philippines. That's how the the president now have been elected. He's uh, the son of the former dictator. And that's how they oh, did it. Yeah. That's how fake news, just like, oh, martial law wasn't real or this and that and whatever. The fake news won, man. He's elected. Yep. You so, know? you know, more than anyone, too, just how dangerous it can be. I mean, mm. there are really very real and tangible consequences to misinformation. So, what would you tell someone? to teach them that, oh, the article is could be a misinformation or a fake news? So, of course, this is a really complicated question, too, especially in the age of, uh, of technology and the digital age where there's so many different sources for information, right? It hmm. can get so overwhelming because, I mean, there's no shortage of different <laughs> publications and websites and blogs. So I guess my biggest recommendation would be to, even if you're not necessarily sticking to the super famous news sites, like even if you're not only reading the New York Times or the Mm. Washington Post or these national legacy media publications, Mm -hmm. I would recommend just reading as much as possible. So for example, if you are reading a story about I don't know, a wildfire, let's just say, Mm. and you are forming questions. The best thing you can do is try to find as many articles as you can about that same event and just consume as much news as you can and and see how different outlets, people, uh, political sides are talking about this, reporting on this, because then you can kind of see what details change and what details don't, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like one thing that's really important is just consuming a broad variety of media and really just trying to read as much as you can about a single event. And also, you know, to always remain skeptical. I mean, of course you need to trust the news as well. I mean, a lot of misinformation comes from a distrust in the media, but at the same time, especially if you're reading news from an outlet that you don't think is credible, uh, maintaining your reservations and doing research on how other outlets are talking about that same thing can be a way to kind of, you know, figure out what's, what's the reality of the situation. But I know that's a pretty convoluted answer. It's just a really complicated question, unfortunately. It's all good. You understand. I appreciate that you answered it. Quickly, going back to your uh, article, where did you, how did you think about the the title, Freedom Just Nerd of Hope? Yo, I was like, I love this title. I get excited with yeah. title. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, titles are super important, especially in, in magazine writing, right? Like, hmm. it can be really really nice to just have a beautiful title that makes people ask questions and draw them in. Luckily, I had an amazing editor who helped me decide on this title, but 
it comes from something I wrote uh, directly in the story. So the reason why I settled on freedom just north of hope is that Bethe Liberdad, which is the community I report on, uh, Liberdad directly translates to freedom. Mm -hmm. And that community is just north of a town in the Dominican Republic called Esperanza, which translates to hope. So I know that... uh, I love it. I love it. It's so clever. (laughs) Thank you so much. I mean, of course, it was was just really fortunate and just poetic that these places were already named that, you know, Um, I... I felt like I wanted to highlight that as best as possible because it just really stuck out to me right away that it just so happened these places were named after freedom and hope. It was it was it was like ironic but beautiful at the same time. I love the title. Well done. Oh, that means so much to me. Thank you. Mm-hmm. How long did it take you to write the whole article from the moment you wrote the first sentence or the first word even to like done? So this particular story was more of a quick turnaround just because, I don't know, based off of when I had to travel and when it needed to be finished in order to get into the May issue of the magazine, Mm. I just, I didn't have too long to work on it. If I'm being completely honest, I don't remember off the top of my head how many days, but I am pretty sure it was just a few days of writing. Um, and then I would spend some time on it, crafting it and going back and forth with my editor about any sorts of, you know, suggestions. And then it would go through copy editing, back checking. So it's kind of a multi tiered process. Um, but the actual writing itself, I, I could be wrong, but I remember it being a matter of a few days, probably just going back and forth on it. That's amazing, man. It's beautiful. It is your favorite piece so far? For Deseret Magazine, yeah, it's my favorite piece so far. Mm. I am, again, just so incredibly grateful that I had the opportunity to tell this story. And I'm also grateful that I had the opportunity, like you said, to write it more narratively. Um, And for that reason, I think it's my favorite piece that I've done so far, just Having, having it be so human-centered, that's something that I really like to do when I have the chance. Mm-hmm. I love your style. I love how it starts with, I've read some of your articles too, and how it's like, not even actually connected to the story, but it leads you to it. Thank you. Like, um, uh, like you'll talk about, let's say for this, like, oh, this woman is standing on the side of the, of the road and just staring at the sun, it, sunset, you know? I love that style. Did you learn that style or did you hone it? How did you learn that that, that, um, that style of yours? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, there are a bunch of different, you know, tracks, I guess you can take in journalism, right? And when I was studying journalism in college, I did specialize in magazine and feature writing and a class, a type of writing that I really fell in love with was narrative nonfiction, which is where you are, you know, including a very strong sense of place, using a lot of description, building out your sources as characters. The goal is writing completely truthfully and honestly with a lot of in-depth reporting, but in a way that almost makes the reader feel like they're reading fiction, right? Like Mm. a storybook or something. Because that can be the most engaging way for people to consume information. So I was first exposed to that style of writing in college, at least learning how to do it for the first time in college, but uh, also working for a magazine with editors who have written for various magazines before. Uh, it's It's been a privilege to be able to hone it, and it's definitely an ongoing process. I am always honing it, um, but... Yeah, I mean, it, it's been really great to to kind of pursue that style of narrative writing here at Deseret whenever and however I can with the help of incredible editors. I cannot stress that enough. Yeah, it's a team effort, definitely. Uh, I think we're there, but um, before we close out, do you have any last remarks? Yeah, so I do just want to say again, thank you so much, Aaron, for having me. And 
also for having a podcast like this. I think storytelling is so, so, so important. So I admire everyone who makes an effort to amplify storytelling like you do with an immigrant's life. Um, And I guess the only thing that I'll plug is just Deseret Magazine. Um, We can, or you can read Deseret Magazine stories online. We also have a print issue that comes out every month definitely worth checking out because it's a national magazine uh, that also reports on international issues. So there's something in it for everyone. Excellent. Again, Natalia, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Bye. Thank you again, Natalia, for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you listeners for listening. This is Aaron Deliosa for An Immigrant's Life. I'll see you guys later.